Good evening and welcome to the 10th annual Boston Real Abilities Film Festival. My name is Kat Gareshka and tonight it is my pleasure to welcome with us the makers of Scattering CJ. One of the documentaries this, in this year's lineup that I have been getting a lot of amazing feedback on from our viewers. Um, before I introduce our guests, uh, I'd like to offer special thanks to GE Aviation in Lynn, Massachusetts, and specifically to Military Systems Operation and GE Veterans Network and the Disability Advocacy Network. Thank you so much for your generous support on this event. And now I'd like to give a very well, well, warm welcome to our guests, uh, Andrea Kalin, who's the director of the film, is the creative visionary and founder of Spark Media, a production company dedicated to crafting stories with a strong social conscience. Her films have aired on major networks around the globe, screened theatrically to sold out audiences and earned more than 100 industry awards, including a primetime Emmy, Golden Globe and WGA nominations. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Katka. I wish I could say your name as smoothly as you do. <laughs> you you, you just did. <laughs> it just sounds lovely, <laughs> but we're really excited to be here, especially Hallie and I being uh, New Englanders and Bostonians. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have with us also Hallie Toomey, together with her family, they are the subjects of Scattering CJ. Hallie started the Scattering CJ Facebook page after losing her elder son, CJ, to suicide in 2010. Her and her family's story has inspired thousands to have a more open and honest dialogue surrounding mental health and suicide prevention. Thanks for being with us, Hallie. Thank you so much for uh, asking me to be here. And as Andrea said, the fact that this is um, happening in Boston and based out of Boston is um, really touches my heart. We now live in Florida, but I will always uh, have a piece of me that, that resides in the city of Boston. So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. And finally, we have with us Ethan Oser, who is the director of photography and associate producer on the film and is a Washington DC based cinematographer and editor. He's been a part of the award-winning Spark Media team since 2013 working on development, production, and outreach for multiple feature length documentaries and digital projects. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, I'd like to go to you first um, and ask if you could share a little bit about the background of the film, most specifically the story of how you came across a photograph of a Red Sox fan, which has eventually led to this incredible project. Well, when I saw CJ's face um, and sporting the red Red Sox tee, uh, he was irresistible. Uh, that smile just drew you in. And I was curious, what is this story that surrounds him with such a beaming smile that was infectious and felt so uplifting, yet the story that was communicated um, of how his mother was on a mission to uh, preserve his memory, to uh, share his legacy, to make sure he was not forgotten and that he had taken his life was one that was deeply troubling and sad. And so that kind of juxtaposition of this beaming, smiling picture and a very profoundly tragic story drew me in originally. Um, we first discovered this in 2015 and at that time, the country too was really fractured, still are to some extent <laughs> polarized. And I was in the need of a story that I felt had uplift. And I was inspired by Hallie's strength, Hallie's resilience, uh, this global community that rallied around her, uh, that I felt this is something that we should dig in and explore and see what the possibilities are of teasing this out into a documentary. And that's when we contacted Hallie um, over Skype. And um, really, you can pick it up from there, Hallie, what happened on that call. So that was a call that I really had no um, you know, preconceived ideas of what would happen. I, I had no idea who Andrea and David were, um, but it, you know, turned out to be a two plus hour 
connection with people that have become so important to, to our, my whole family's lives. Um, it, it felt right. It, it sort of was a scary thing to think about somebody wanting to do our son's story because it, it, we just didn't see what the, what the story was. We couldn't you know, picture what Andrea had, um, you know, in her mind for this documentary, but we really quickly understood that if anybody could do this story and do it well, um, it was Andrea and her team. And I remember John and I, my husband hanging up from that call and just thinking that we really didn't know what was gonna happen, but that it would be um, amazing. And that we just fully trusted Andrea from the get-go and you know, have never ever regretted um, committing to this project. And we're so proud of it. Um, Ethan, you know, because of this initial apprehension that, you know, Hallie's family and, and Hallie had about being filmed um, for something like this, what, what were some of the challenges that, that, um, that you faced as, as a cinematographer specifically, but also as producer in approaching a, mm -hmm. a, a subject that's as sensitive as this, you know, in a family that's grieving? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the toughest part is that um, the stories that we've always worked on um, and the entire time I've been working with Andrea have been very human. Um, and it's all about, you know, human feelings and life experience. And in this instance, it was very difficult, more difficult in this case than any other to separate being a person who's in a place um, absorbing what Hallie and John and Connor are sharing while also being behind a camera and having to remain sort of that fly on the wall, invisible person who, you know, can't reach out and comfort someone and just maybe comes across as a little bit cold. It's just kind of, you know, Hallie or John or Connor were crying. Then I just had to stand there and let them do it. There was no way that I was able to connect with them. So I think that was the greatest challenge for me, for sure. Mm. That's really interesting. I, I, I can I can see how that how that happens. Um, Hallie, it's been what eleven years now. Yeah. Um, and you're done mailing CJ's ashes. Obviously, uh, it was a finite process. Um, but while this part has ended, something started in your life that continues. I mean, you ostensibly became an advocate, uh, and that is a journey with. I guess, no end in sight? You know, it's the one thing I had no, um, I just didn't see that coming. I, I really didn't want to be an advocate. I mean, to, this is a world I don't want to be in. It's something that I never envisioned. I used to talk a lot publicly about organ donation because I believed in that. And um, I, I just remember resisting in the beginning, thinking there's nothing I could ever say that's going to change. Um, and now it's, and it sounds corny to say, but it's literally like the air I breathe, I need to do this. I need a purpose. CJ's suicide was um, graphic and devastating and tragic. And for 11 years, you know, I live with an enormous amount of guilt. Um, having the community that formed through Scattering CJ, which was so unexpected, I've said a million times, I'll say it a million times more, was such a gift. I had no idea that there were people who needed to hear my story, who needed to share their own stories. Um, I had no idea the power in that community and in social media and through Facebook, how you know, it opened up this, this box to us of um, kindness and support and, and beauty. And you know, my life is still full of sadness and tragedy. I just got through Mother's Day, which 11 years later you'd think would be easier. And it's, you know, quite frankly, it was hell yesterday. And, um, it's still super emotional today. It just, it doesn't ever get easier. So to know that through sharing CJ's story, not only am I, um, keep my amazing son's memory alive and having other people know him who didn't get a chance to do that, that I'm also, you know, indirectly helping others. And, and the fact that people have been open and willing to be raw and honest with us has given me the, the motivation to carry on. And certainly the documentary you know, I expected it to be this tragic, bittersweet, sad thing. And it comes out and I see it and I've watched it, I mean, probably hundreds of times by now. And every time I, I smile, um, Andrea took the story, which really is sad and bittersweet and tragic and made the, the documentary end on a hopeful note. It gives people, you know, an understanding that 
there are other choices. I constantly am saying now it's, you have to be, uh, there's gotta be a mindset in our society that it's okay not to be okay. And that you can ask for help and there are people out there. And so it's just, it's, it's a part of my life now that I don't think I can ever stop. I will talk about CJ and suicide prevention and you know mental illness awareness and to anyone, you know, groups of one or one million, it doesn't matter. If, if somebody's willing to listen, I'm willing to talk and I'm incredibly thankful. Um, as much as I would still not you know, wish I could be here, I, I don't wanna be here to talk about this because I can't change what's happened. Um, it's, it's just, it's a part of everything I will continue to do for the rest of my life. I think one of the things that the film really, you know, does is sort of prove, at least to me it did, and I think that I'm not alone in this, that there is such a thing as good grief or a better kind of grief. There are different ways to grieve and there are ones that are, you know, uh, more, creative and more, um, you know, do what people believe that we should do is that grief should be a shared experience. You went to the extreme, <laughs> sharing the experience with the world entire. Um, I'm wondering, and this is a question for, for all three of you, if, 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 it's, if it's come up in, in your conversations and in your, you know, reflections on this, if, if there are, alternative ways to do this for other people. Not everybody can go out there and you know spread their loved one's ashes. It's not, a, it's not an option for every, um, for every person who's grieving. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's something that, that, that you've had a chance to discuss you know, with, with, with friends or with, with viewers. I'm sure that this is a question that your viewers would have asked. I think um, and Hallie, please jump in at any point. But I, I really think, speaking personally, that I learned um, by being present with Hallie's family, you, that you see that grief is really messy and it's not straightforward and it's zigzag. And everyone really does grieve differently and what they need as they are on this journey of grief also differs. And I think that whether it's something that is as extraordinary as Hallie has done, or to grieve quietly and be able to share your grief as you need to share it, I think I learned through Hallie how to be a better listener, how to be more sensitive to people and to how you um, interact with someone who's grieving you know, watching the words that you use at times, being more sensitive to their feelings, um, understanding that a grieving person wants to continue to talk about their, their loss and, and keep the memory of their loved one alive. And not to, I, I watched how some people rallied behind her in such beautiful and moving ways and others moved away uh, because they were uncomfortable with her grief or, or were putting timelines on the grief. And so I just learned so much by um, not just what she did, but how she um, handled herself, how she took this journey and understood that her husband, her son, herself, her friends, um, all were going to take this path on their own. They had to find their own way through it, that you don't get over it, you don't get beyond it, but you can only get through it. And all of this I learned really through Hallie. Um, and I feel like others can as well, that part of the power of this story is that she uh, doesn't sugarcoat things. She shows how vulnerable she is. She shows how raw and... Um, how deep and profound her hurt is. And I think that, and how, I, I think that others really came to her and to the site. And, and as she said, opened up this whole community because people weren't, weren't sharing as openly. They were afraid to be vulnerable. They were afraid to say something and then have others perceive them differently. And I think that, what she shows is how 
you know, how she's been able to grieve, but that there are ways to support people who are grieving uh, that we can learn from. There are ways to be better listeners when people are grieving. And um, I think that CJ's story and her love, uh, both and their families, is an inspiration, not just in the acts of what people did, but in the heartfelt intent and passion and motivation that she had uh, to keep him a part of the family, a part of their legacy, even create a new legacy without CJ in it. Do you find that the pandemic has, has influenced or affected how people um, receive the film now and, and actually just the, the film's uh, journey from your point of view of you know, the festival circuit and, and and whatever whatever your plans are for the film, I mean, it's you know, it is May is Mental Health Awareness Month. There's a part of me that feels like we have been in mental health awareness for 14 months now. Right, I think so because I think in ways um, we're more attuned to be empathic, and I think that what we try to do with Sparks Films and in particular with Scattering CJ is to use cinematic language, to use images, to tell a story from here and allow people to experience it from their heart. And so that as they're experiencing, it's not a um, tell, it's a show don't tell. And I think in that allows people to be able to step outside of themselves. And I think in this period, we've all been forced to step outside of ourselves and to step into places we're not comfortable um, and to confront things and be challenged by um, the lack of control and all kinds of assaults that we've been beset with. And I think that the pandemic in that way, uh, this story is part of that. And, and how about the global community that we're all much more connected to because of this pandemic? Hallie's story, um, shows this was happening and can happen um, in times when we're not in this global crisis. And so I think that it just, the window to me, and, and Hallie mentioned this, of the kindness and compassion and just goodness um, when we're so um, immersed in uh, uh, feelings that are dis of despair and dark, the lightness that comes from how people rallied around her and her family and this story and CJ to me is the kind of story we need also during this pandemic that, you know, as everybody's been saying for 13 months, we're all in this together and we are. Hallie. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ethan. Oh, go ahead, Hallie. No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what I would say is, I mean, just sort of, just sort of in terms of the ability to connect with people. Um, you know, I think the internet gets kind of a bad rap um, for being a horrible place where only horrible things happen and where people bully each other. But I think Scattering CJ and the community that Hallie really helped build is proof that the internet is capable of really incredible things and capable of helping people connect. And you know, we have the four of us speaking plus captions, plus an interpreter. And we're able to share this with people all over the globe right now, which is something that wouldn't have been able to happen otherwise and something that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise as filmmakers. Um, the audience that we've been able to reach has been, you know, multiple times larger than it would have been because, you know, we say this time, this day, come see the film, come listen to us speak. And people are there from across the world, um, which is given- We're not constrained by physical space. Exactly, the uh, right. you know, 100 seats in a theater or whatever, but now we can have an audience of thousands um, who are all experiencing the same thing at the same time. How has it been for you, Hallie? Uh, so it's been, it's been different and, and really the saddest part of it is the, the piece that I miss the most is the human touch that came with the very beginnings of this film. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday about how I'm so thankful that the world premiere was able to happen in Camden, Maine, because that's a moment I, I can never, I will never forget. It was powerful in its, in my ability to hug the people who showed up and who, you know, stood there, looked me in the eye and, and thanked me and I'm going to start crying. Um, you know, I missed that part. I, 
I know when people see the film that the takeaway that they walk away with, I wish I could be there to help them understand that not only are they taking the time to watch it and to learn and to then use that as a, something to spark conversations, but how thankful I am personally that they're willing to do that, that this is not just a small you know, part of my life, this is my life. And so I'm so thankful that festivals like this have been able to find a way to make the film available. I think it's it's such an, uh, ex an extraordinary, you know, experience to be able to have so many people eyes on. But I, I do hope someday that it goes back to the in-person because I, I feel like I'm, you know, I have so many hugs that I want to hand out and the power for me is that, you know, I just, I miss that human touch. And whether the people who hugged me in the very beginning understood it or not, it's that I, I walked away with so much more what, while I was, be, you know, able to physically attend um, these screenings. So I've been so thankful to be virtually everywhere that I've been asked to be. I try desperately to make myself available because this is just so important. I mean, I'm doing everything I can to not have other CJs. Um, you know, I want no family to have to go through what, what we still go through. Um, and suicide is such a lonely, like when you're left behind, it's lonely. And it's, I think about this pandemic where we've been so shut away and under, you know, having this film, it's, it's, it's a perfect opportunity to use it as a tool to talk to your loved ones and to spark those conversations that I feel like are so important. So um, it's been quite a roller coaster ride. I hope it isn't over. I hope there's other audiences out there, other people, um, ways that this film can be used as a tool. Um, I will continue to be as sad as possible that it's my son's story that's the you know driving force behind it. But I, I said earlier, I can't change it. So we're going to use his story and his um, our our family's story as CJ's legacy to to hopefully enact positive change and to prevent others from following in his footsteps. Have you had any um, feedback from all of the people that became involved, all of the people who, you know, as, as most of them say, had the privilege of scattering CJ's ashes uh, wherever it is in the world that they traveled to or were. Um, have you heard from, from them after they've seen the film? Um, and I'm interested in seeing, you know, if, if if sort of if the, if the word spreads also through them because of the film being out there now. Andre, I'm probably gonna have to let you, I, I mean, I'm thinking I, it's interesting that you're, as you're saying that I'm, I just really I think I've asked too many people that, you know, that have participated and what their thoughts are. And now I'm immediately intrigued. I, I want to know. I've gotten tremendous positive feedback from people who have been following Scattering CJ and have wanted to see the film. Um, you know, one of the best parts is those that still reach out and say, I scattered, you know, CJ, I, I planted a small tree. I just got one the other day. I planted this really small tree and scattered CJ's ashes underneath in my garden. And can I send you a picture? It's grown so much. And it's, you know, are you open to that? And I, I'm like crawling through my phone, like, yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> but I think I've, I've, I don't know, Andre, maybe you have talked to people more directly that have participated um, overall, I'm just getting an amazing, you know, sense of what people, uh, how they feel about it, how they think it came out and that, you know, more people than not say to me that it, they're shocked at how hopeful, and that is the word I'll go back, you know, to repeatedly that it's, they left feeling, expecting to feel sad and they left feeling hopeful. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, just even in the production, it led to widening our group and who even participated to make the film like Kelly uh, from Australia who just that story of her and her children and her family and CJ's picture on their artboard in their living room that was one of the first clips right Ethan that we saw yeah. and immediately and that's, and that's the that part was, of the film where I start bawling right <laughs> Yes, and we did too. And it doesn't matter how many times we've seen that. It's still so heartfelt, so authentic, and that she 
took her entire family. And when she introduces everyone, her mother, her stepmother, her father, her stepfather, her sister, the sister's boyfriend, her children. And it just, you know, that group communal experience is something that was just astounding to me. And when we did a crowdfunding campaign to try to get the film off the ground, literally, um, Kelly reached out and said she was a graphic artist and no, she doesn't have a deep pocket to necessarily fund us or help fund us, but she would do anything graphically that we would need. Uh, and sure enough, years later, we kind of called on her and said, hey, Kelly, a couple of years ago, you mentioned that you're a graphic artist. Would you think about, you know, creating the map based on that very map that you shared with your children? Because it would just have that organic feel with the film. Um, so she became part of the team. She went from a scatterer and a friend of Hallie's to part of the team. And then at Camden, we surprised Hallie and brought her in from Australia. And they were able to meet for the very first time. Um, Will and April, all of the people, Heidi, that have been featured in the film, um, do they say, you know, this is wonderful or uplifting? I think they leave out the superlatives, but what they say is we are there for you whenever you need to do anything. And it's the, you know, that action, that support, in their beings and wanting to help us and wanting to get the film out and screen it or participate as we are doing here in Q and A's wherever they may be held around the country or the world. That's the way I feel uh, that we've all stayed connected and we continue to stay connected that way. And um, we'll, you know, recently had emailed us, just let me know anything I can do, I'm there. And these were scatterers that were connected to Hallie and yet then through one more pass feel now connected to us too. And that's the way I feel like this community continues to grow. That's, that's wonderful. We have some questions rolling in from the audience as uh, so I'd like to, uh, like to um, read those out to you. Um, the first one that I have is what was the moment you realized that scattering CJ was growing to the scale that we saw in the documentary. And you know, if, whoever takes on this question, remind us how many places in the world CJ was scattered in, because that is something that is always uh, you know, shocking to hear. Go for it, Hal. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I don't remember the exact moment when I knew it was um, taking a life, taking on a life of its own, but it, it happened. Um, you know, in the film, you see it where my phone, that literally happened. My, it was like, I went to bed one night and then woke up to, you know, those notification dinging on your phone over and over and over. And I, you know, somebody messaged me and said, do you realize the story went on CNN? And that it just, it, it happened so quickly. In the very beginning, I thought if we had 50 people that would offer to take CJ's ashes, that that would be a success. I mean, I went into it with no idea of what a success meant, but it seemed small to me. And when it, it, you know, it came overnight and when the next week or two, I had very quickly 50 offers to over 5,000 in just a few days. And we've, to this day, I mean, they're still coming in. We're over, I think 22,000 offers of places to take him. I think at last count, it was over a thousand unique locations. Um, and you know, you said very early on that we're done mailing them and we are formally done mailing them. I'm certainly not, um, you know, the process that we went through the whole actual journey of mailing out his ashes is, is done, but I still have people that are reaching out every day. Um, they trickle in now and that's perfectly okay. But that said, you know, I know it may be over, but here, let me tell you why um, being involved in this would benefit with me and why I want to help. And here's the location. And you know, there is a finite amount of CJ's ashes, but we still have some. And I'm definitely, um, you know, my heart feels like it's still open to the possibility. Uh, it's hard to say no to somebody when they've come to you and just said, this is something that I literally feel compelled to do. And I'm gonna cry again. Uh, you know, this is my son. And when somebody who is struggling on their own 
feels like helping my son see another location would in a, you know ultimately help them you know i wish i had an unlimited amount of cj because it's just an honor it's an honor to know that something that i started with just no idea what it could turn into has become such a powerful force and it's you know i, I for me more than anyone i just i'm so thankful I'm thankful for the people that do this, that, you know, that, that continue to come to the Scattering CJ page, those that go to the film website, to Andrea and her team for continuing um, for film festivals. Like, it's just, you know, there's not enough ways to say thank you. And obviously after 11 years of his death, I'm still profoundly impacted and will never be okay. So I, I just am so thankful that there was a community and there still is a community. I mean, the page is still holding strong at 21,000 followers and sometimes I don't post anything. I mean, life gets hard sometimes and I get busy and, um, but I'm still getting messages every day. And so I just, I, I could talk about being thankful so much, but I really, really am. Have you, there's a question from, from, from the chat that I, that I wanna ask and I wanna add to it. The, the question is, do you remember the first person that, that responded to your, um, uh, to your you know, call? Um, but, but I want to add to it. Have you have you thought of um, a symbolic replacement for for actual physical ash ashes scattering for the process to continue in the way that you know that people are reaching out and and in such new you know numerous <laughs> people reaching out to you asking uh, to do this. So those are the two questions. So I absolutely do remember the first one and it's because um, it was one of our very good neighbors, an amazing friend of ours in Maine. Um, she lived right up the street. She was going to take a road trip. She was driving by herself from Maine to Canada and she, CJ adored her. Uh, her name is Christy and he just loved her. And she said, I would be honored if CJ could come along on the ride. And um, we were just so excited. She's actually the very first picture we had of a hand um, on the Facebook page was Christy's hand when she took CJ to Canada with her, but we packed CJ up in a little, um, I, you know, a little vial, I guess, and put a lot of ash in there. I mean, she really took CJ with her and she just said she talked to him the whole way. And it was an amazing moment for her to take this long road trip by herself and bring him along. And um, so it's, I won't ever forget that because she's just such a good friend of ours as well. And, you know, Connor, my son, it still lives very close to Christy's family. And um, she helped us sell our home and help Connor buy his home. So we have kind of a really beautiful relationship. Um, so yeah, I remember Christy. We had as a family certainly scattered CJ's ashes in a few places, but Christy was really the first person that, you know, we said, here, take our son. Um, and she, so she did just so wonderfully. And and in, as far as thinking of other ways, not so much, but only because there really is still, I still do have ashes left. People have said to me, some of the unattractive and unkind comments we've had over the years to have um, circled around the fact that, you know, we couldn't possibly still have ashes. And we're, you know, I had somebody suggest to me that we're using sand and whatnot. And the truth is, you know, whether people, hopefully never have to think about it, but when somebody is cremated, there's quite a bit of ash. And we really, to this day, have been, have only given a, a very, very small amount of CJ, which sounds like a strange thing to say, but it's the truth. So we still have some, if I wanted to mail them out um, to replace it with something else, I'm not sure what that could look like. Certainly open to the idea. Um, people have asked us to, if they could just simply print his picture, the, the picture Andrea talked about, the Red Sox shirt. Um, and, you know, we've had people send us back pictures of them simply holding the picture at some place that CJ hadn't been and thinking of him. And I mean, that's amazing. So in terms of replacing, I'm not sure, definitely open to that. Um, but I don't know what that would be. So yeah, I think the picture idea is, is, pretty, is pretty great. I think that works. Um, and I, how, I just wanted to add one thing, Katka, I think, which is so important that every scattering for the family was really significant and it didn't matter how exotic it was it was that each was heartfelt and i was wondering hallie if you could talk about even um the school teacher 
who may have uh, scattered his ashes in their backyard or some of the you know less uh, let's say you know beyond borders and these um, really remote locations but some of the evil just the simple heartfelt acts that really touched you and your family so i think what happened early on because what i was doing in the very beginning and i still continue to do it to this day if it comes up i would share the videos or the pictures that people would send back and it seemed like all of the locations were you know the top top of um, mount kilimanjaro or outer space or you know the eiffel tower and we really quickly realized that it almost seemed like people were afraid to ask for locations that weren't you know deemed so spectacular and what i i said over and over and i still feel to this day is that one andrea's right no scattering no offer of scattering cj was any less than any other one and it's the ones that would leave me sobbing at my kitchen table that Andrea said there was a woman who, who messaged me and said, I, you know, her the very first line was, I don't have um, a tall mountain to offer you. I don't have, you know, the pyramids of Giza. I don't have that. But what I have is I have a daycare that I, I run out of my home and I have children that are running and laughing and playing every day. And what I can promise you is if, if you send me your son every single day, you know, 365 days a year, he's going to be surrounded I'm gonna cry with mm. laughter and with um, happiness and joy and he'll never be alone. And I remember writing back to her and saying, I'm so sorry you ever doubted that offer that, you know, no amount of, of Eiffel Towers could top that, that that's a gift. You're giving me my son, you know, he'll be, what mother doesn't want their child even in death to be surrounded by such joy so we've had so many of those you know i i had a i have a mental mental health worker that her version of scattering cj she carries him with her when she counsels people when she goes into homes with people in crisis and she said they don't know he's there but he's there and and she will never you know she apologized she said i don't think i'm ever going to leave him somewhere because he the power in this scattering is that he's helping me help them. Firefighters that have tucked CJ's ashes into their helmets as they go in to fight fires. I mean, just little every, well, that's not an everyday thing. I hope <laughs> that's a big thing, but everyday, you know, small offerings have been some of the most profoundly impactful to myself and my family. And again, not that outer space and the Eiffel Tower weren't fantastic because they certainly are. But I've been really um, honored that there's been sort of a organic balance that they're not all, mm -hmm. you know, front page news type headlines. There, there, there's the small moments. The, um, you know, even Andrea had mentioned Will, who found uh, somebody. To this day, we don't know who did it. They took CJ's ashes, and obviously, I mailed them to them, but they never told me what they were going to do with them, and they had a small sort of concrete little block made out it's featured in the film and had this beautiful plaque put on it and took it down and you know will came across it at the memorial and i mean the the lengths that people have gone to to honor cj in such a way that is you know so far from what we originally asked for i asked for a moment in time you know if you're on your trip take a few steps to the left of where you are and scatter CJ's ashes. And if you'd be so kind, send me back a single picture of that moment, simply so that I could be a part of it, or I could feel that I was there. And to know that somebody or lots of somebody's, you know, went out of their way to do all these different, really unique and powerful scatterings has just, you know, I, I, it takes my breath away still. It will always humble me to my knees to think that this is this is part of a, a unexpected part of this process. And you know, it's a, it's beautiful. People are asking if if CJ actually made it to all fifty states and how many different countries, if you guys can remember. Andrea, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to kick to you. Oh. Yes. What do you it's, think? Yeah. Um, the think, list of 
fast. It's one of the few things that every once in a while somebody will ask me to direct them to the list of the full locations. And if you've seen the film, you see the scrolling. Um, you know, I I don't list. Which was a lesson in geography for most <laughs> for us here at Spark. Half the places we had never heard of, we didn't know how to spell, we didn't know where they were. Um, but I would say I would take an educated guess and say he has been scattered in all 50 states. And I think internationally, Ethan. It's about 110 plus and, countries, I think, yeah. was the last count we had. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I was telling you, Andrea, when we spoke earlier, I'm from Poland. He was scattered in three different places in Poland. <laughs> I mean, wow. You know, that, just, that tells you something. Um, I want to give Hallie a little bit of a breather and go to you guys and ask you what is next for you uh, as far as filmmaking goes? Well, I would say kind of the funny thing with us at Spark in some ways is that we are um, platform agnostic. So this year we've been working on a virtual reality experience. Uh, today, Ethan was editing a podcast series. Um, we have a couple film ideas and, and are so excited that the theaters are opening up again because we wanna experiment with doing live theater and film and fusing uh, the two mediums of the stage and cinema. And so we've got a few of those projects that are in the pipeline and the VR, we're already, we have a demo that's been out and uh, was on display at a museum. So we're kind of dabbling in all these different platforms. And I think in that way, COVID also helped kind of break us out of being able to feel you only tell stories through one medium. Uh, and that you can really kind of incorporate, even in this world that we hope will be one where Hallie says we can hug and be next to someone in this darkened sanctuary and hear them breathing, crying or laughing next to us, but we can also expand those experiences. And I think that this year has given us the opportunity to try to see how to match story with medium and how sometimes to fuse mediums to even create a different kind of visceral experience when you are, you know, uh, watching, participating, interacting in a story. Ethan, did you want to add something? That was fairly comprehensive. Um, <laughs> no, no, not much to add. I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the long and short of what we have coming up. But also on scattering CJ, I think it's important that um, it's also been part of our kind of culture with the films that we take on, that once they're premiered and they've run the festival circuit and perhaps they make it to the airwaves or they don't or theatrically, we are just as vested in what people call impact. And so this year we have done numerous screenings, uh, mental health boot held mental health boot camps um, are using this now. We hope to reach communities that need to be heard, that need to be seen. And that you know includes uh, people of color, Native Americans, uh, Latin Americans, uh, all you know. So we want to have the film translated in different languages, make sure it's ADA compliant, and so that every community, which has their very unique challenges, can use this story as Hallie shared as a tool. Um, as a way to open up conversations, as a way to create a safe space. So people can talk from a pain, you know, from the point of pain to, you know, a point of purpose. And I think that that too, we are fully committed that we will continue to bring this film um, to wherever we can into communities that we feel are on the margins and really need to have more um, resources, more materials, more capacity to be able to open up conversations. We have a comment from the audience that speaks to ju just, just to that. And, and, and it reads, hopefully through your sharing of CJ and your story, folks will take action to be sure to increase awareness um, of need for mental health care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I just wanted to, to, to 
offer one more reflection and, and see if you if you guys want to spin off of that. Um, in Jewish tradition, when someone dies, uh, we say, may their mem memory be a blessing. And what you've done, Hallie, um, you know, for, for CJ's memory is, you know, is not only a blessing for, I think, for your family, because I think it is, but for, you know, for so many people in, in the world uh, that have shared this. And then what you guys have done with the film is, is a, just a brilliant continuation uh, of that. Um, well, I would say always may CJ's memory be a blessing and may it also be a movement. And on that note, I want to thank you all so much um, for being with us today. Um, everyone, please uh, watch Scattering CJ. You can do so at Real Abilities Boston through May 13th. Um, tell everyone you know to watch this film. They won't be sorry, they do. They might cry, but they won't regret it. <laughs> um, and everyone, please join us for our next live program. That's on Wednesday, May 12th. And we will be speaking with the director and the star and the co-star of the in-between, uh, Mindy Bledsoe and Jennifer Stone. Um, I wish you all a very good night. Thank you again so very much. And thank you to GE, who are, I think, with us here tonight. Thank you so much for supporting and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.